uh, thank you, Jean. And uh, thank you for Rish to actually see that. It is a great book, a fantastic book. Very emotional as well. Um, well it's great to uh, see so many people here, and so welcome especially to those who came from overseas, including uh, Kitty and uh, Bruce there, and also um, from Macau. And there's a bunch of New Zealanders as well, which is great, because that's the original community I came from, and Barbara McClellan, who I haven't seen for years. It's great to see her here, and um, Grant, who knew me before I was a Baha'i, and I've bribed him not to tell anybody about uh, my behaviour at that time. <laughs> I went to Firesides, where Grant was singing. At that stage, he was singing the Beatles numbers. Um, it was kind of before he uh, burst into his brilliant career, but uh, thank goodness he did. Um, if you want to um, not take notes, please feel free, because if you want to hear some of the detail, I can email you my uh, talk, because this is a writer's festival, so I thought I, would write, uh, I thought I would speak not so much about the content of my book, although the next book, the third book, which is called Sacred Stairway, and it's not out till about July, August, so I can't really promote it for sale here, but um, I would thought I'd talk about writing uh, to people who were thinking about writing a book or who have already written a book or who actually want to know about the mechanics of writing um, because I thought that that might encourage more people to write books and also to encourage the enjoyment of Baha'i books and especially Baha'i histories, which uh, I'm very keen on. Um, so Baha'is who write about history uh, about the faith surely have the best possible choices of any topic in the world, in my opinion. Uh, and why do I say this? Well, Thomas uh, Friedman, the New York uh, journalist, columnist, who's written many books, ha uh, just said the other day in a, one of his columns that the most uh, popular and best-selling book of all time is The Da Vinci Code. No, it wasn't, no. <laughs> it's a very good book, very technically good book, The Da Vinci Code. So if you ever want to read how, uh, see a skillful writer, see how he encourages his readers to get to the end of the book, have a look at that one. Um, but the best-selling book of all time is the Bible. Now why did uh, Thomas, what, what did Thomas say that, that Thomas Friedman say that it was the key to that one? He said it was a collection of stories and I think if pushed he would also perhaps say it also has the X factor that it tells about three manifestations of God, Abraham, Moses and Jesus Christ. So it's got the, the key drivers of history right within that, uh, that best-selling book. But, and so, if, in my opinion then, um, we as Baha'i historians um, can tell stories that include uh, accounts of the twin manifestations for today. So what an amazing opportunity for us to tell um, fantastic stories as writers. An even more important perhaps reason was given by Abdul Baha to Professor Edward Granville Brown of Cambridge who met um, Abdul Baha and of course Baha'u'llah himself. Abdul Baha wrote this, you should so endeavour that in future centuries your history may become the undisputed authority, may be considered sacred history and accepted both by the communities of the kingdom and by the just among the peoples of the world because the greatness of this cause is not as evident as it should be due to repressive measures repeatedly taken by the government of Persia and the severity of assaults. But, long before, will it, but, but before long will its truth, like unto the luminous sun, be seen and discerned. And Abdul Baha was the exemplar, so we should watch carefully what he, do, what he does and follow what he does. But he did. And he wrote a history very early on in his, uh, in his life um, uh, called A Traveller's Tale, which is about the story of the Bab. So it, if you want to read a, a great book of, of Baha'i history, I suggest you start there. Now, so he must have considered Baha'i history very important to have spent his time doing that. Shoghi Effendi himself, within the first decade of his ministry, translated The Dawnbreakers, and I encourage every Baha'i... To, I'm very slow to start reading this book. I read summaries and all sorts of stuff, but actually the book itself is a cracker, so I really advise it. It's not boring, it's fantastic. And uh, he of course wrote the masterpiece, the historical survey, God Passes By, which is 
an incredible uh, best book I've ever seen for compression of interesting facts in a small amount of words. It's, and it was, they say that it was uh, one the best way to um, enjoy it as well as to read it out loud. So, so read, read that book out loud, it's a fantastic book. Ruhia Khanum herself, his, uh, his uh, wife, his widow then, wrote The Priceless Pearl, which is a fantastic history of the book, one of my favourite books. Hands of the Cause also write, uh, wrote histories, other Hands of the Cause, I mean. Um, well, Mr. Samandri's uh, memoirs have been recorded, but um, Dr. Ugo Giacchari, um, Mr. Kardem, Mr. Bill Sears, Mr. Fazy, Mr. Furatan, Martha Root, John Esselmont. So Baha'i history is important. Treat yourself by reading some of the titles. And the, the reason I mentioned Lighting the Western Sky, um, well, I could, have, I could have mentioned a number of books, but that one perhaps isn't as well known. But Lighting the Western Sky gives you a great insight, not only to the American pilgrims, which it's about, the early American pilgrims, but about Abdul Baha himself. It's just an amazing um, treatment. Today I will um, draw um, on my forthcoming book, um, which is part of a trilogy of the story of the Shrine of the Bab, and it's called Sacred Stairway. You can see it there, the Sacred Stairway. And it's due out about August this year, maybe earlier. And to help illustrate what I'd like to say, um, is I'll, I'll, just, I'll give you a list of the topics that I'm going to move on to. One is choosing your topic for your book. The second one is motivation to write. The third is when to start and how to work. Four is research. Five is solving problems. Six is style. Seven, photographs, illustration and cover. Eight, publishers. Nine, editing. Ten, arrival of the book. Eleven, promotion. And twelve, the future. And don't worry, the bell will go if I go on too long. <laughs> so the choice of topic. Right, the topic has to be really interesting to you because you're going to live with this topic. Like, I live with mine since 2011, it's still sort of like just doing the wash up now, you know, I'm still answering questions and figuring out things I could have put in and should and will do in the future. So you'll be living with this daily for, for, for well, in my case, um, what's it now, um, seven years, eight years? Um, so make sure you like it. It's not a chore if you like it. Um, fortunately, the beloved Guardian dismissed the idea that there was anything like Baha'i art. So. You choose your topic, um, don't have to follow what other people think. Um, art draws on the inspiration provided by the concourse on high, not by the committee on low. So, you know, you, you, <laughs> they're up there waiting, I tell you, and as, as every writer will know. Again, fortunately, there's guidance on moderation in the Baha'i's teachings. We're all in favour of moderation. We're moderately in favour of moderation. And that's a reinforced by a commercial uh, and market imperative. If you and only you are interested in the number of full stops in the sacred literature of the Baha'i faith and you think it would make a good book, mm, think again. Will the publisher take you on? If you self-publish, will anyone want to read it? I mean, it's no point in writing something if no one wants to read it. So that moderation helps you choose your topic among all the other ones that, topics that you're interested in. I guess choose a topic of importance. Of course, there are minority interests, you know, um, aspects of the faith that um, certain groups are interested and not others, but um, make sure you do not earn an involuntary PhD piled up high and deep, if you get the uh, rather, um, uh, let's just say, earthy uh, connotation. Um, in terms of my book, um, Sacred Stairway, it's part of the trilogy, so the publisher had expressed interest anyway in the book of the trilogy, um, but in terms of the third book, I think Baha'is will be interested to read about the Terraces project, because that's what it's mainly about, and why the project was established by the Universal House of Justice. Why did they decide to do it? And uh, how was it carried out? You know, how was the design, where did the inspiration for the design come from, and how did they build it? And then what happened after that? Um, I became interested in the topic myself in 2005. I was in, just newly arrived in Haifa to serve there. Um, in the Office of Public Information and I was at a social event and uh, this guy started talking to me and he said, I said, well, what do you do? And he said, well, I have worked on the terraces, just finished, served on the terraces. And I said, well, what did you do? And he said, oh, I was an engineer. And I said, oh, well, basically I inter interrogated him as a journalist always does with his victims or her victims. 
And uh, he said, well, I was a graduate of engineering in, in Iran, and um, I asked Baha'u'llah to put my abilities to the service of the faith. And next minute I found myself out in Iran in the mountains building highways. He said, I was so puzzled. He said, and then my sort of career came on, and then, this, then I came over to Haifa, and I found myself effectively building a highway up a mountain. Because that's what the terraces are in many respects. They're a, a road up a mountain. So that, oh, I said, that's a fantastic story to include in my book. <laughs> I didn't even think of a book. No, I just thought it was a fantastic story. But it did make me very interested in the terraces project. Remember that when you tell somebody your topic, if you do, uh, they will, sorry, um, human nature, I don't know what it is, often people will try and dissuade you. Oh, it's too hard, you'll never do that. I had that one. Too hard, you'll never do that. You'll never get the resources, you'll never get the information. You know, like, for instance, um, yeah, uh, how, how are the sacred remains of the Bab moved from Iran to um, the Holy Land? All sorts of things. So, and, and in fact, one topic, I was actually totally dissuaded, and I never wrote that book because somebody dissuaded me by saying, oh, no, you won't be allowed to do that. <laughs> Crazy. So don't listen to anybody else. Whatever your topic is, go for it. And don't think there are, any other, there are others who are better than you, even though there probably are. Um, as the Master said, as your faith is, so shall your strength and, or powers and blessing be. Sterling Moss, who was the great uh, Formula One car driver, said there were a lot, lot better drivers around than he was, but he was the one who actually did it. And Grant Hinden Miller can't remember telling me this, but he said that when I first met him, he said, oh, there are probably other people who are better at it than me, you know, writing songs, books, movies, and everything that Grant's done. He said, but I actually did it. No, I'm actually doing it. And Grant actually did it, and now look what, you know, the, uh, uh, the results. So just, just be confident and go out and do it. Right, what's the motivation to write? Well, people... People sort of like come up to me and I'm thank, I thank them for that and they say, well, um, thank you very much for your service and writing the books and I feel sort of like guilty and a bit perplexed because writing books, writing this is, I would do this more than anything, anything else in the world I can think of. So it wasn't a sacrifice, it's not a sacrifice, um, except perhaps financial, uh, but <laughs> didn't feel like it. Um, so I worried about this. Perhaps I've got the wrong attitude and everyone else is writing for um, service reasons. And then it's finally twigged, twig, just recently really, that um, a key injunction of the faith, uh, one expressed by the Master in Paris on the 10th of November 1911, was the first principle of the teaching of Baha'u'llah is the search after truth. It's a life... and, and that should not stop, surely, with the acceptance of us of the Baha'i faith as a faith for ourselves. It's, it's, a lifelong, it's a lifelong project of searching after truth. Don't rely on the summaries and the Rui books about the history of the Baha'i faith. They're not for teaching you about the history. They are for training you to understand. But that's very... All those the histories are basic. You know, it's our obligation in many ways to find out about what happens to the soul after death. What happened... Uh, and the, to Baha'u'llah, what all this, this is the search after truth that Abdul Baha was very strong on, and he mentioned it time and time again in his talks. So, thank goodness that um, helps justify my curiosity. Baha'u'llah gave this uh, guidance to journalists they should inquire as much as possible and ascertain the facts, then set them down in writing. So, there we go, that's another encouragement to write. There's also guidance that craftsmanship. Art is an act of worship that's done in the right spirit. And it can also fulfill the injunction to teach because, as the Guardian said, art can better awaken such noble sentiments of the faith than cold rationalising. So music, writing, sculpture, painting, poetry, this can really awaken um, the, uh, the spirit of the faith, which is what attracts people. Other motivations for me are actually quite mysterious. Uh, 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 other motivations are the mysterious, um, undeserved, I've got to say, wafting of grace in the hours before dawn when I'm sitting there writing on sacred subjects. It's like quite mysterious and weird. You know, suddenly you feel, wow, what's this? You know, and then, and then it's hard to explain, but writers and um, creative artists will know. Um, the thrill of learning something new that nobody else in the world 
except maybe one or two or none, uh, have figured out or, or, or know about, which is amazing. Um, I couldn't wait for my first book to come out because it, the information that we found was just so amazing. Um, and of course, I'm a journalist, so I love to tell uh, other people uh, information. Um, but the immersion, the spending all your time immersed in a sacred and holy subject, well, that's fantastic. You know, what else would you rather be doing? I can't think of anything. Um, and, you know, <laughs> there are plenty of things I'm not much good at, but I guess I'm okay at this. And as a profession, as a uh, journalist, I suppose, I should, lift up, I should live up to uh, my professional responsibilities. So that's my motivations. Uh, right, so let's just talk about how to do it, because I think you're probably interested in anybody who might want to feel they have a book in them and, and want to write. Um, look at that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, who wouldn't want to think about how that was done? Amazing. Whoops. That's... <laughs> Everyone know him? Tony from New Zealand. He was, he, he's responsible for so much of the gardens there. But look at that. Amazing, amazing. And I hope you all have seen it or will go and see it. It's a wonder of the world. Okay, so for when to start and how to work. Okay, so at least for, for me, being a journalist, working a daily newspaper, um, it was good training because there was a commercial imperative for me starting immediately and finishing something. Finishing something is really important because if you don't finish, well, where's your book? Uh, the imperative is actually an award, the award of the boot. You will be kicked out of your job if you don't provide information, your story on time. So I was used to deadlines, you know, so give yourself a deadline. Um, deadlines are, you know, and oh, pro banish procrastination. Um, people, we tend to put things off. I've got a book in me and I'll get onto it soon. No, start now. Just write something down now. Do a plan. I'll, I'll tell you about that later. And in fact, I've been guilty because I found that uh, when I was going through my papers yesterday, wrapping up these three books, I found an A4 page and it was dated 2004 with a structure of my book about the Shrine of the Barb. And I'd forgotten all about this. I must have planned it in Haifa, but I didn't start until 2011 in Brisbane. So I procrastinated. Okay, so daily routine of a writer. Everybody's different. Um, but this is how I do it, and I have read about other writers, um, um, and most of them follow a fairly similar routine, except for the first one, which is starting with a fervent prayer, <laughs> because you need a prayer. So I suggest the short prayer of visitation, say it every day before I start writing. And get something read, researched, or written every day. Um, think about it every day. I do. Especially in waiting rooms, at the lights, doing the dishes waking up in the morning, or wherever you have the chance to think about what you want to think about. It's amazing how things pop up into your mind. You put uh, one and one together, it feeds into your mind, and answers come into dreams or half-sleep. Uh, I found something amazing in my half-sleep for my first, my first book or second book? My first book. I, I was in a half-sleep and I figured something out. And then, um, or while walking the dog, I figured out something just recently while walking the dog. Um, they come to you because you're thinking about it all the time. Not concentrating necessarily, but there's something going on in your mind. Find your quiet time. I read that Dan Brown, I'm, I know I'm promoting his book, but author of the uh, Da Vinci Code, I read that he started at 4 a.m. and I thought, oh, okay. So I followed his advice and that resulted in my finishing his books because I got up at 4 a.m. and wrote till about 7.30 before all the demands of life come upon you. And it's great. For me, it's great writing in those early hours. It's very feeling of spiritual time. Um, there are other people, um, Anna Rice, who, who wrote the vampire books, she, she does it fittingly from midnight till three. Uh, not, not for me, but for some people. So you pick your quiet time. You need a time, and you need a time by yourself where people aren't um, interrupting you. Um, uh, music, I listened over and over again to the works of the late uh, Tony O'Connor, who's a Sunshine Coast uh, composer, especially Ocean Rise, that number, and When We Sail Away. And, and not music with words, though, because that would distract me thinking about words. No, it was more uplifting me on the air um, inspiration. I, my emotions would be, would be raised, and sometimes into tears, into a mystical thing. And then I'd have a cup of, cup of coffee, which was like the, like the um, rocket fuel as well. So you get the music. You'd be lifted in, in, in inspiration. And also, I like to surround myself with a few photos of what I'm writing about. 
um, or um, you know, favorite, um, your favorite picture of the master or Shoghi Effendi or whatever you, it inspires you. Um, and, and you know, talking about starting, look, just take one step at a time. Don't think you know, you're going to write the history of the Baha'i faith in Brisbane and think, oh, no, it started way back in 1950 or whenever the first Baha'is were here. And I've got to do. No, just, just um, write a synopsis. Write a 300-word thing of the story that, as, as much as you know. So that's usually, yeah, about 300 words. Write out a list in the order of likely chapters. One, the first Baha'i in Brisbane. Two, um, establishment of the first local spiritual assembly in Brisbane. Three, the downturn in the sec first, this is just guessing, second, I haven't, haven't studied it, but you know, so you think of all the things that you know and then you put them in order like chapters and then um, write, one of the, one, write one of the easiest chapters that you, that you can find. So, you know, let's just say 3,000 words isn't much. Um, so you just write an easy one and then, oh, that was easy enough. Let's, and it doesn't have to be all factual by that stage. You know, you're going to do a lot of research. Then another, and then another, and then after a while you've got a list of essays. See if you can then, you might want to start again and start from the start or link them together. Okay, so how to figure out what your story is. This was a uh, technique that uh, um, I was taught in journalism, and that was um, imagine yourself running pa past a door and shouting to a group of people in the room on the other side of the door as you're running past what your story is. It's a really good way of sharpening your mind. And you need to know what your story is, otherwise you get off on all sorts of tangents. Um, so uh, mine was, it's a story of how and why 19 garden terraces were built in the 1990s to adorn the shrine of the barb, and I rush off. Right, that's my story. It's the story of how and why 19 garden terraces were built in the 1990s to adorn the shrine of the barb. And then I divided it up. First one, 1963, because my last book ended in then. 1963 to um, about 1986. So what happened? What did the Universal House of Justice do? What were there any preliminary work done on the designs? What were the pressures? What about the building of the Universal House of Justice at Setov? And how did that relate to uh, the Shrine of the Barb? And it does relate to the Shrine of the Barb because Mr. Amanat, who has been appointed as the architect for the new Shrine of the Master, he made sure that the dome of the, or the seat of the House of Justice is not higher than the Shrine of the Barb. Um, and then the, the second one is eight, an 86 to 99, so that in 1986 to 1999, so that covers the inspiration, the design, and the actual construction of the terraces. And then part three is the completion, the inauguration, the effect, and what happened. And then I had a couple of annexes. One is interviewing about 12 or so staff who were on it, uh, working, uh, serving on it, and looking back. So it couldn't really go into the narrative of the book because this one is in the 2000s. Um, it's more looking back, what do they remember? And then I did another annex on the restoration of the shrine, which is not really the um, part, of the, part of the construction of the terraces, but it, something had happened between 2005 and 11 with the Golden Dome. Right, so got all that now, you're ready to go? You should be running out the room now because I told you not to wait. Okay, research. Herbert Hollow was my woodwork teacher at school. He gave the rest of the class excellent, very good, or good. I got fair. Hopeless. My mother used my tray that I made at woodwork for decades. Moral of the story. You might not be an expert, but you may be able to still produce something of use. <laughs> Look, I'm the last one who should be writing about construction and building stuff. I mean, putting up shelves would be like, if I could build up shelves, it would be more of an achievement than writing a trilogy of books. So I knew nothing about construction, concrete, project management, irrigation, horticulture, yeah, you know, like, so I had to read very closely the uh, Vineyard of the Lord, which were publications that came out uh, during the project. I don't know whether those who were the highest then at the time will remember these sort of magazines that would come out. Um, and it was the chronicle of the project. So 
I had to read them, and then I had to divide the ARC off. The ARC projects were going simultaneously. These are the big buildings on over here near the Universal House of Justice. So that project was going on at the same time as the terraces, but I'm not writing about that. My, st my stories are about the Shrine of the Barb, right? So I had to stick to my topic. Otherwise, oh, I could have written a whole book about the, ter about the uh, ARC. And um, so I wrote that, and I had to divide that up. Then I had to, oh my goodness, there's so much detail about construction and what they do, you know, like, whoa. And it's all new to me, so I divided it up into upper terraces, lower terraces, the Abbas Bridge, that's the one halfway down, Terrace uh, 19, the one at the very top, um, Hatsianut Bridge, that's the one behind the shrine that you probably know about, horticulture and animals, irrigation, VIP visits, visit, visits by the highs, inauguration, post-inauguration, so I divided things up so that I could get a handle on them, you know, and I had to understand um, what they were talking about because I had to then, my duty as a writer is to explain it to a lay audience uh, in clear terms um, so that they can understand it and also find it interesting because this is one of the big challenges of this particular book. The first book, yeah, they, the stories sort of are, are interesting in and of themselves, but telling stories about construction well, you know, it's a challenge, and I'll get on to that. So, um, so I broke my uh, subject down into manageable, manageable size pieces. People ask me, how do I find my information? Um, well, write down a list of all the books that you think of that you know about on the topic. Look at their bibliographies, which is the list of books that the writer has consulted in the back of the book, usually. Um, big, long lists. Um, talk to people, of course, who know about the subject. Uh, look at um, magazines, behind magazines usually, journals and websites. You can search newspapers if you need to. Search the net, and it's fantastic. Look at Wikipedia. Wikipedia can be very helpful. And then Bahaipedia, whatever it's called. And then, of course, you search images. Oh, you search uh, uh, www.bahai-library.com. That's a very good site. Um, search images on Google, um, the Baha'i Reference Library, yep, all those kinds of things. There are many sources. Um, as I mentioned, these notes can be available to anyone who wants them. Find somebody to accompany you. Accompaniment has been mentioned many times in recent times, hasn't it, in the Baha'i Faith from the Universal House of Justice. Accompaniment's really important. Um, they will be often your chief encourager, and, and also, in my case, I was very fortunate um, to have Fuad Izzadinia, who was a former custodian of the Shrine of the Bab, and also a former custodian of the Mansion of Masrae, and an architect, and a also interested, very interested in researching history. And he, I can't pay enough tribute to him because he not only sort of helped me in terms of finding information, confirming tr Persian translations, all that kind of stuff, and finding, telling me stuff and information, but he also. When it got too hard, and it, get, and it got too hard, he would encourage... Okay, it got too hard. Okay, so um, you need someone like that. Okay, so write down everyone who helps you in your, in your work. Write down everyone who helps you for your acknowledgement page at the front of the book. Um, um, they deserve it. And also, everyone, every name in that acknowledgement is a sale of your book. They'll always buy the book. <laughs> Very commercial and cynical. No, it's not already for that reason, but, you know, somebody mentioned that, and I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Their family will buy it for them, too. Now, make sure from the start that you write down what you find and the source. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, who was a member of the House of Justice, was talking to me when I was serving in Haifa, and he was talking about one particular researcher who forgot to do that, and it's, they couldn't really publish this book because he, he said, oh, I know it came from somewhere, but I can't. Uh, you have to be able to find your sources, so make sure you write down your sources, like the book that you got it from and the page number, the magazine, or the email that somebody sent you, whatever. And I've forgotten sometimes to do this and struggled to keep up. For Sacred Stairway, I consulted the Baha'i World, letters from the Universal House of Justice. Um, I wrote emails to Mr. Nachavani, a former member of the uh, Universal House of Justice, who responded within maybe about 12 hours. <laughs> Amazing. Um, behind newsletters, um, emails to Mr. Armanat, um, Skype, uh, Skype interview with uh, Mr. Sabah, who was there at Mr. Faribur Sabah, the architect and the project manager, 
who, of this uh, project, who was very generous with his time and even invited me to stay with him in his home, which I did, uh, a, an amazing privilege with a, a great Baha'i, and um, he really helped me with the book. Um, of course, all the, um, I looked, read it all, as I mentioned, all the volumes of the uh, Vineyard of the Lord and interviewed the staff who worked on the project, and of course those who, um, as I mentioned before, who restored the shrine for the annex. Okay, so we're now moving on to the next uh, um, topic, which is um, solve the problems. Okay. So to solve the problem of wasting your time um, and your energy, uh, stick to your so stick to your topic. I put a. <laughs> okay, I might be a bit pathetic, but you know. We might all be a bit pathetic, but I had to put up a sign in an office saying, the book is about the shrine. So I had that stuck up on my wall because I kept on veering off, you know, like the first one. Like, how can you resist stories about Abdul Baha? It's just amazing, you know, and the more you dig into them and the more you find, you feel like writing about Abdul Baha. And the second one, of course, is Jogi Effendi. So you, it, the, the story is not, a, the book is about the shrine. It's, yes, you tell stories about the master, but you must, Stick to your topic about the history of the shrine. Whatever your topic is, you stick to it. Otherwise, you'll waste your time and um, you'll spend um, ages on other topics. And um, the pro uh, problems about protagonists, in other words. Uh, the chief protagonist, if you want to, you know, the main figure for the trilogy is the institution of the shrine, right? So the shrine of the bar. That is, the, that is the topic. Okay, what about for humans? Right, in Journey to a Mountain, the master was the chief protagonist. In Coronation on Carmel, the guardian was the chief protagonist because these are the, the heads of the faith who were driving this project forward. It was Baha'u'llah's project and they were doing it you know, un, um, as their responsibility and to his direction. Um, but for the third book, this is where it became difficult because the Universal House of Justice is really driving the project forward and it's an institution. So it's not a person, it's a group of people and it's not permitted, it was not permitted for me to, um, well, you know, it's, the guidance is not to single out individual members of the Universal House of Justice when you, uh, you talk about the institution, you write about the institution. So that's, it's good, but it's not really that human interest that attracts people in, that Thomas Friedman was talking about the Bible. Human interest, that's how Rupert Murdoch made his fortune, based on human interest. Um, and that's how journalists, they know that they have to write a story, they have to include a story about a person and otherwise it can be dry. So what was I going to do? Because I didn't really have that... Um, Protagonist. Um, so, uh, of course, the most prominent person in the story just has to be the project manager, the architect, who was commissioned by the uh, House of Justice to design the terraces, and he was the project manager. And an incredible, an incredible uh, thing that just constantly blew my mind. That not only did uh, this gentleman design the terraces, but he also had to project manage their construction and at the same time the art buildings. So he was the project manager. In other words, supervising the actual physical building of the staff, with all the staff, of course, but he was the number one. Um, and Steve Drake, the New Zealander, was his deputy. But, you know, like, that was his responsibility to the Universal House of Justice, to project manage. And, but I couldn't, like, you can't elevate a person, um, you know, like, as you could a hand of the cause who had a spiritual station or the guardian or a master. It, he was a Baha'i like us, right? A, very, a genius, yes, but he was a Baha'i like us with all our um, ups and downs. And uh, um, so I think I managed to do it. I constantly worried about it, whether I was sort of like eh, writing about it. But anyway, I think I managed to do it by having him describe the tasks, um, even in discussing the origins of the design, which I'll get onto in a moment. Um, actually, I'll get onto it now. If we can get. Okay, close your eyes and I'll get right back to the um, early, early pictures. Right, right, I'm just going back to some. These are, these are pictures of, uh, that illustrate the book, but right at the, um, there he is. But uh, there's Steve. <laughs> okay, let's go back to some things that you might. Okay, whoops, that's Robin. Um, nice to see old friends. Ah, hello Robin. Hey, what happened? Oh, there we are. Okay. 
So uh, Mr. Sobo provided me with that, so that's one of the earliest um, conceptions and models. So you're among the few people in the whole wide world who've seen that. Um, okay, so, um, so describing, describing things like this. Um, here he is. Um, and um, in the background you can see some of his drawings. Uh, this was a computer model in those days of, um, you can see the Abbas Bridge, which is halfway down the lower terraces. You, know, that, you don't even notice it when you're going up that it's a bridge, unless you look over and then you see the road, but generally you know, it feels like a terrace. But that's one of the commuter, uh, early um, uh, models. That's number nine, that's terrace nine, just below where the shrine is. The shrine's on terrace ten, this is number nine below. So that's how the early concept, a drawing. Okay, this is one of the early models. Are they sort of working? The inspiration of the artist, of the great uh, creator of the design, is uh, you know the, the creation of, a, of an artwork is, is, is an amazing experience. But, and so this was one of the, as his, as his mind was um, drawing on the inspiration, which comes, it's described in the book of the many scriptural references, the biblical, the Baha'i, uh, the Babi, and the Baha'i references that uh, stimulated the design. But anyway, this was one an, earl an earlier one. So I described this, oops, I described that kind of thing um, here. You might be interested in that one anyway. Um, so, you know, so, so rather, than do, um, do, rather than spend time on his personality, I mean, to a certain extent, to a certain extent, you know, I do describe how he worked because um, he, um, Anybody knows Mr. Saba? He is not a gentle, loving, soft Baha'i who doesn't know it his, from the ground, right? He's not like that. He's a dynamo who drives forward to get something done, and that's why he presumably one of the reasons he was selected by the House of Justice. So he is a, he is a strong individual, amazing, and I, 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 I regard him as um, a friend, and I don't regard him... I don't, wouldn't burden him with um, anything else, but I needed to describe how he worked. Right, he was assertive. Right, so, so talking about solving problems, giving up. Um, it will be too hard, but don't give up. Rely upon the concourse on high, because I presume that they're the ones who are accompanying us. Okay, because you're, you know, you're working on an important subject. Right, so when we're moving on now to um, style. The style of your book, right? Oh, how did that get there? Enjoy it anyway. That's how. That's the construction site. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Okay, so um, Edward Granville Brown, as I mentioned before, um, who became one of the great proclaimers of the faith. And you remember, he visited the whole. Um, after, after, uh, but despite falling off the path and not taking a long time to get back on, on the true. Uh, depiction of the faith. Um, he had actually been first interested in the, in the, in the Barbie faith by uh, picking up a book in the, um, in the 1880s in, the Cambridge, in Cambridge University Library and it was called in English The Religion and the Philosophies from Asia, in Asia Central but with a French title. And this book was by an out and out racist uh, who described and approved of the persecution of the Barbies. Um, calling themselves veritable communists and every bit as dangerous as French socialists. So it was a sort of like, you know, an off-the-wall comment by an off-the-wall guy, but, but written in a great style. So why did Brown like it? Brown said, to anyone who's already read this masterpiece of historical composition, this most perfect presentation of accurate and critical research, well, um, in the form of a, this is the key, in the form of a narrative of thrilling and destined interest, such as one may indeed hope to find in the drama or the romance, but can scarcely expect from the historian. It's needless to describe the effect it had on me. In other words, he liked the book because it was exciting, it was drama, it was romance. So we can use those um, elements in the book. We can't let them be boring. We have enough of those and we don't want any more. So Baha'u'llah said, in every art and skill, God loves the highest perfection. So our books hopefully should not We'll try and avoid them being badly written and presented. There are many kinds of style, you know, like, um, and this is what you get in journalism training, you go through the style. So. 
So Whitehead University is, is saying as a conclusion at the end. Da -da -da -da, and therefore, diabetes is caused by drinking too much Coca-Cola, right? So they come right up the end. Writing a news story with the main thing at the start. Coca-Cola causes diabetes. And then justify it. Right, that's the news story. Flip. Writing a feature story on the newspaper, and one of the best places that you'll see it is the diamond uh, shape. Um, so you start off with an anecdote. You know, I was sitting in the room at the uh, Baha'i Centre, and uh, we were all sitting around discussing, and I met famous uh, people from New Zealand and Macau. Da -da 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 -da. And so it's, everyone's interested in the story that you tell. But then you get to the nitty gritty. You, you get to the, a writers' festival that is aimed at encouraging. Um, new and current writers to produce works of, uh, related to the high faith, whether literature, film. So you get to the, that's the heart of it really, but you introduce it by a human interest story. That's the diamond shape of the picture. Um, so I tried to, um, in my books to aim and combine a lot of these um, styles. My aim, but basic aim was um, readability, of course. Um, and reach original information and putting together um, the jigsaw of already existing information, um, upliftment and a dash of excitement, um, and sometimes pointing, but not too, or too much, to the significance of the story. Um, readability is vital in journalism. Um, you'll get fired if you can't make your stories re uh, readable, and uh, so you need people to read your stories, and hopefully right to the end. In fact, I'll start my bus behind somebody else without they're reading my story. I'm so disappointed when they turned the page before they had a chance to finish it. I felt like tapping off, hey, I spent all morning on that story. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. So the same histories, right? It's worthwhile using the rule of journalism. So these are the rules that you're taught. Um, who, what, where, why, when, and how. So who did it? What did they do? Where was it? When, why, and how, right? Who did it? The Universal House of Justice with a team of uh, high volunteers. Uh, what did they do? They built the 19 garden terraces up the shrine of, uh, up the hill of Mount Carmel for the Gulen Shrine. Uh, where is it? Oh, I bet Israel. Uh, when was it? Oh, mainly in the 1990s. And to um, and why? Well, because we, um, it's uh, in the master's writings that, uh, um, that there'll be uh, terraces adorning the shrine of the bar. But how did they do it? They did it with um, um, modern technology as well as um, traditional building technology, a whole range of things that's described in the book. So if you use all those things, then you've sort of more or less uh, got your guidance. Imagine a reader too. I mean, who's going to read your book? This is one of the first things. I've sort of figured out that the main readers would be Baha'is. Uh, though um, there will be also non Baha'is, some people, sorry, from the wider community. Uh, that's the obese community. And. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the history of history fails me. I'm not going to have much of a career as a singer. I'm trying to. Okay, so you know, imagine you're a reader, right? Um, are you boring them? Okay, try not to use the same words often. I look, I found one well, that I use too much. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I'll drive you crazy. And, but I'll eliminate it each time, I promise. I, that word, that word, so I went through with a word search. And wrote that word, and oh my god, it's you know, 24 times through the book, you know, something like that. That's a bad thing. Because people get irritated, it's just for some reason, you know, even sometimes subliminally. Um, and avoid the words that few people understand. Um, I read once a book here by a very famous Australian, I had to use a picture on every page of this book because uh, it, it was sort of like showing off. Um, <laughs> and it's best not to do that. You want to make your book understandable. Don't challenge your readers in that respect. Active verbs rather than passive. Um, it's like this. The verbs used by the author were active. <laughs> or the author used active verbs. Right? So the second one is the active. The active mean, for some reason in English, um, it's, it's energy. By using, we, we tend to say, oh, yes, the, uh, the event was organised by Ian and June and Mason. But it's best to say, Ian, June and Mason organised the event. It's just, more energetic and interesting. So you really be careful. Occasionally, though, passive is, you need to use passive, but just be careful. Go through. I went through all my texts looking for looking for this error, 
and I found quite often, and I do it for a living, so um, you, you need to check that. Keep your books interesting. Um, and be a bit sparing with adjectives, you know. It should speak for itself. Verbs are very powerful, they say, and so, you know, um, not too many, you know, wonderful and stuff. So. Um, keep sentences shortish with not too many thoughts in one, you know. Um, we are particularly, we are members of the scanning generation now, you know, people look at stuff and scan it, but they don't get it immediately, they, they, uh, they don't have much patience. So remember that people are scanning stuff and they're not that keen on going back and trying to figure it out. Um, in very sentence length, not too much in the abstract, although you need some in a spiritual book, of course. Keep your quotes shortish, and short people who are being quoted this is your editor should help you with this, is introduced before the quote starts. You know, you can't just start a quote and say, that was said by, it. because somebody's written out, who the dickens is, you're already confusing. These are subtle things. Subtle things, things. I know it sounds pathetic, but you're taught in journalism, you know, the Prime Minister today said that, da, 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 and then, then the quota. You don't start off with the quote, you know, we're going to abolish this, that, and the other, the Prime Minister said. It, it just doesn't work, and you, you, you cannot have that in your texts. This is technical stuff, so I hope, hope it's of some interest. Um, yeah, and be careful. Don't do what I just did, lecturing and moralising. <laughs> Involve people as much as possible, though. The problems I faced uh, in my, with all three books, but much more with The Sacred Stairway, was that um, the books were not only aimed at telling a story, you know, like a narrative, and, and this happened, and then this went wrong, and then this was... Uh, it's, uh, I had to also uh, contain important and attributed historical information, so that can a little bit, uh, you know, it needs to be done. So um, I had to try and keep the narrative going with, um, uh, with this important historical information, and I had to trust the readers of this volume in particular that they will climb with me up the terraces and down the terraces um, as they read the book and see how the, how, the, how the project was, you know, like they started on the lower terraces first, and of course that won the hearts of the people of Haifa because, you know, they had noise and dust and everything, but when they started to see the beauty of the lower, they thought, oh, at least it's worth it, you know, we're putting up with all this stuff. Um, for instance, you know, uh, see all that there, you can imagine, I wasn't here at the time, but there might be people who've served in Haifa at the time here now, but it was a noisy, it was dusty, and poor old people of Haifa had to put up with it. Um, now that's what I meant about when that vision started appearing to the people in Haifa who are down below, uh, on, well, that, uh, that started, you could start to see the beauty unfolding. That's, um, by the way, a New Zealander, Steve Drake, with, of course, the project manager and architect, Mr. Subba. Um, okay, that's, these are the things that I'm describing. That's a bridge the bridge being built behind the shrine that we now walk over and hardly notice that it's a bridge and there, there are the upper terraces. Uh, that's the people putting, the, you know, doing the steep upper terraces. Anybody who's walked up the upper terraces know how steep it is. And we often used to get that query in, um, when I was um, escorting people down, the VIPs down the terraces, well, how come we're not allowed to go up? <laughs> well, they'd say, you're lucky you don't going up because it's very steep. And, um, that's the geo web that they filled with soil. You can see them, that's underneath some of the upper terraces, how steep it was to keep the soil in place. So these are the things I describe in the book, but you know, like describing construction in the book without too many individuals, you know, you didn't have time to, you know, and then build it this, it's not quite like that, but uh, to a certain extent, but you're talking about a construction program, how to make it interesting. One of the ways to make it interesting was to divide it up with subheadings in this book, so that upper terraces. And, oh yes, okay, lower tier. So that's not all jumbled up. Here you can see almost finished, but not quite, because um, there's the bridge, but that's uh, Terrace 11. That's, I, worked, I worked under that one. That was one of the last ones built where the security and the public information buildings were. It's an amazing site. Um, okay, that's the, you know, these are things I have to describe. Um, a Baha'i, local Baha'i in Brisbane, um, Abdul Jara, he was, uh, involved in building that bridge. So if you ever see Abdul, say thanks very much. Now we can get up the lower terraces. Uh, did a great job. <laughs> we can get up and down. 
Um, so I tell his story in the book. Oh, that's the aerial shot of Hatsunut there. See, the, see down here? So they had to lower one, a part of the, they had to lower the road. That's how they sold it to the council. You know, we, we'll lower the road for you and make it a much better road without a, the bump that was causing all sorts of accidents. So they lowered one side and then they lowered the other side. You know, it, it was a staged process, but that, that's, that's how I had, I had to learn all about how they do that kind of stuff. Because they kept the road going with all the cables, the TV cables and the, um, you know, electricity and sewerage and everything like that was going on. Very skillful. We had a lot of great Baha'i engineers working on this and uh, local staff, you know, Israeli staff and people from overseas. So you can see that that's Hutsi not there. Of course, it's hardly recognisable now. See how high the, high the road was before? That's on the right. You can see the, that's just half of the road on the left there. So they had to lower it that far. <laughs> and it's the oh, isn't it beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Man. Okay, so these are the, they are the skylights of the Office of Public Information. Um, and that's the entrance to the, the, and this is the security there, but um, describe, uh, describe that bridge. That was a major part of the, you know, a big challenge of the construction. And you can see, as I mentioned, that the art project was going on at the same time as the, ter the upper terraces were being completed. By this stage, I would imagine that the lower ones are fairly well on the way. So this is the kind of challenge that I had, is to the challenge I had was to describe um, things like um, the construction and um, that's a bit more personal because that's um, the sculpture of the eagles, of the eagle. That's uh, everyone there will, um, anyway, I'll get onto that later. Um, so. Um, had the, uh, had the text been narrative driven, if, it, if I'd let myself just tell the story, then it would have been full of people, uh, people talking and saying, oh, what a great privilege it was, and, you know, but they wouldn't, it, 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 would, it would become repetitive and it would focus on individuals and that would be against the policy of the House of Justice. So I think that the book, this book is, to me, I find, oh, that's um, Mr. Sabah with Amatul Baha Ruhiya Kanem, they were very close. Um, the... Uh, the result of the book, I think, yeah, it's a fairly heavy stew, but it's really got quite a few spices in it. To me, it's very interesting, and I, what do I know about practicalities? Nothing. But I found it very interesting myself. Um, okay, so seven. We're now on to, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to bore you. So we won't. We'll talk about photographs, illustration, and cover. Like Photographs, we sort of tend to... Um, not emphasise them enough, but look, they're so important that in the 1920s, uh, Shoghi Effendi sent us an Australian called Effie Baker to, the whole, uh, to, to Persia to take photographs of the holy places for, to illustrate um, the um, dawnbreakers. So he recognised how, how, and that was long before with television and everything like that, but he made sure that photographs um, illustrated that particular book. So make sure that you find and store a range of photographs um, on your topic. And you can make your final selection later on with an assistance, with the assistance of a graphic artist who usually specialise in this area and they can advise on enhancement. Those earlier ones in my books, in fact all books, uh, William Maguire of the Brisbane Baha'i community, he has cleaned them up, like taken, gone into them, into the digital, and taken the dust and everything that, it, that had accumulated, the dirt, sharpened the, the contrast, whatever the magic they do. And that's why if you look in, uh, particularly in the second book, the first book, yes, it was done, but the print is, yeah, it's okay. But, but the, the second one, I think, is an is a even better an example of his artwork in terms of photographs. And you'll see in the second book, by the way, some original or photographs never seen before, really. I, no, I never seen them, of the Guardian, um, the first one, and then towards the back. It's very exciting getting in original photographs. Very exciting, so um, make sure you do that if you're writing history, if you can. Um, photos can be found in the Baha'i International um, Archives. You can ask for them, or in the National Archives. You approach the archivists. They're usually very happy to help, or they're always very happy to help you. In books, on the internet, amazing how much is on the internet. In the collections of friends and researchers, other researchers. The United States is very good, very helpful people in the United States. Baha'is lovely. And um, 
don't forget media.bahai.org, which is an official site of the um, Baha'i World Center, and also um, um, Baha'i blogs and even and Baha'i national websites. Uh, captions, um, just on, on the question of photographs, captions are the most read part of your book, except for title. So don't just be slapdash with your captions. Uh, they, they should be easy to read, interesting, clear, and correct. All right, left to right. Don't just assume everyone knows this famous Baha'i and they say, well, is it that person who's Mr. Natchabani or is it that person? You know, like you have two um, elderly gentlemen or even two young gentlemen there. Really, you have to identify newspapers of used to be uh, <laughs> very meticulous in this because the problem is the lawyer's walking out of the court with the criminal, right? And they say, there's, there's the defendant and Mr. Jones's lawyer. And sometimes the defendant looks better dressed than the lawyer. <laughs> so, you know, you could get sued for defamation by saying, you know, like, so, you know, yeah. you have a look now, from now on, you have a look in the paper how many times they make that mistake about not identifying who's who. So we should do that. We, t we don't make that professional, it's a professional mistake. A bit like, you know, killing somebody when you're operating on them, if you're a doctor. <laughs> don't you think? About as bad as that. Do not do it. Everybody loves maps. And didn't William do some great ones in the first one? Um, cover. Yes, people do judge their books by the cover. You'll know some terrible ones and some great Baha'i books we've got down in the library. Oh, but they're now changing. Thank goodness. Now, we, can we get to um, Ben? Can you get to the uh, PDF of my cover? It's in that uh, original one. It's, you can see it on the list there. It's uh, probably in red. OK, so don't think, don't think that just because the book is on a spiritual topic, it should be bland. The cover should be bland and simple, because our manifestation was called The Glory of God, The Blessed Beauty. I think there's a hint in that. Let's try to reflect that name in all that we do. So that's the cover. It colors and, yep. Yeah. So that's the cover of the next one, which you are the only people apart from William, me, Chris, and the publishers have seen it. Um, so just a guidance on, um, on covers. OK, so it's quite simple. On this, so that's the back half, of course. That's, that's the front half. That's the front. But there's the spine in the middle, the spine of the book. And then that's the cover. So if you're looking at the, that's what it would look like. So it's Sacred Stairway, the story of the Shrine of the Baba. So it's volume three in case it's the third volume. Kept down a little bit because you want people to buy it even if they haven't got their first two because the story stands alone. And you know, at the start of each book. Yep. So that's the, uh, that's the cover. And then you have the, always have, a, if you can, somebody saying how good the book is on the back because that helps people. They say, oh, we, we don't trust the author, that Michael Day. But, oh, Janet Kahn. Oh, yeah, we really agree with her, yeah. Okay, so publishers, right? You're looking for a publisher. You want your book published, so make sure it's a commercial process. They've got to sell the books to make a living, right? So you know, um, you have to have a good topic, and so that helps you to get uh, um, interested. So, so I had to, so you know, you need to think about which which publisher you want. So you George Ronald, which is in the UK, and that's got prestige, and a, and and a top editor, May Hoffman, who's just fantastic, and has the heritage of her mother, Marianne Hoffman, and her father, Dave Hoffman. But in her own right, she's a great um, editor and historian herself. Um, the United States has a bigger market, has a big market. So, you know, if it's published by the United States, you've got that big market of the United States. I mean, other books are sold into the market, but of course the US would, be, would like their books sold in their market. India, the costs will be good, probably. Australia's close by. So, you know, you look at your publishers. Self-publishing books are good, but, you know, you have to, you have to market them yourselves and distribute them. And e-books are a good idea. Royalties will make your grandchildren rich, not necessarily you. And it's good to have an expert editor and someone who makes the index. Um, and you know, it takes a while because they have their um, processes, um, and they are um, well, they are um, editors. The, the, the publishers, not necessarily promoters, so you're going to have to help attend to that editing. You will want your stories told, so make sure that you know what you want in your chapters, your photos. Um, I used to think of people um, setting aside time for reading at night when they're lying in bed after a night of Netflix and are soon going to turn the light out. So how long are they going to read in bed, right? So keep your chapters short, 
and it's not too much of a burden for them. And put a cliffhanger at the end, you know. And then something incredible happens. And then they'll go to the next chapter the next night. That's the aim of it. And you'll see some cliffhangers in some of my chapters. Um, and produce, you know, you have to produce your copy clean. Oh, obviously spelling right. And if you do all that, then the editor will generally leave your text alone. You don't want them interfering with it too much. These professional writers don't want them interfering with it too much. And May was very, very um, light, light on her editing, but careful with the spellings, quotes, diacriticals, the high quotes. And Marjorie Tidman really helped me by reading the text before I sent it to May. Arrival of the book. It's amazing when you get the book and, and it arrives in your hand. So this is what you've been looking forward to. Although actually the process of writing is, is the thing, but you know. We enjoy getting the book. And I was thrilled with mine, right? Um, but as a journalist, of course, you're used to the sickening feeling when you spot a mistake in your work. You know, I'm used to it. You know, like, damn. Uh, at least with a newspaper story, the next day you get to write another story and they've forgotten that one, hopefully, unless they've sacked you. But in a book, <laughs> yeah, and cost them thousands of dollars, millions, not hundreds of thousands, in defamation suits. No, but, you know, with your own book, you can improve it in subsequent editions. Well, I had a really weird date that somehow got through. Uh, it was, but it was, it was so obviously wrong that readers would know that it was a, a, a mistake. Um, I mean, the, most of them, I only found about two, two mistakes. Not, not bad. Um, and the e-book coming came out, Spanish edition is coming. And I enjoy reading it very much myself because when you write it, you write it in bits and manuscript and see it on paper, but reading the book is um, very yeah. enjoyable for me. Um, and people, if people um, say they like your book, um, ask them to buy it. And <laughs> if anyone says they borrowed it, you can, you, can, you can pick up a bigger book, like a Baha'i World, and whack them on the head with it, and then <laughs> and say, don't borrow the book, buy the book. We want these books to keep coming, right? So promotion is very, is very difficult, a very challenge, challenging one. Baha'i magazines, like the Australian Baha'i, Baha'i blog, think they're blessed socks. Bless their blessed socks. I've got a website, Facebook, cards and posters, and I don't know whether they work, you know, but the books have sold pretty well, you know, like I've got these posters. You know, if anyone wants one, just come up afterwards. I only charge you 10 bucks. No. <laughs> you've, got, you've got to think commercially, right? Okay, and then you have, a, you, have a book, you have a launch, and then you speak at Ink of Light to people as nice as you, which is really great. And ego, okay, ego. Right, you have to confront this question, right? You have to put yourself forward. I was talking to June about this, you know. Um, in the end, you just have to do it. You know, you have to draw your attention to the book. It's on a topic that you think people would like to read and it will be a benefit to them, so you do have to actually stand up and talk at talks and, um, you know, and you also feel a little bit defensive about the money side of things, but how many cappuccinos, you know, 35 bucks, you know, it's, so, you know, don't give away copies of your books if you can possibly avoid it. And have a, have a, have a generous wife who can um, subsidise you while you're writing. Helps. <laughs> and in the future, well, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future. There's movies, there's videos, there's books. And, and I appreciate everybody um, listening to me for so long. And I will now close. I think I've had the ding. Thank you.